the vernacular and all the rest of it, but way to some other position. Uh, I don't wish to be criticised for being critical of uh, what's going on at the moment, but one would imagine it's sort of porridge between the modern movement and the vernacular movement and a few other things which is going on. And maybe now is the moment for another revolution. I don't want to start going on to that tack. One of the problems, I think, was that the revolution started with um, uh, a very good building industry full of marvellous craftsmen, uh, supported by marvellous artists and sculptors. And I don't know why, but something to do with the modern movement. Uh, somehow these people were... Anyway, what, we're now in a position that we're now out of contact with artists, out of contact with sculptors, and certainly uh, we've got more architects than craftsmen in the building industry. I think um, an architect is a bit like a composer and a conductor in one, and you can't really produce beautiful music without a good orchestra. And I'd be very interested to hear, or I think we'll be fascinated to hear, on what uh, the uh, originators of the revolution now feel about the future. This is not a criticism, it's just a sort of... I think we're very interested to know what they think. Um, this evening is again being recorded, and this time on video, as well, I just realised I should be much more nervous now. I, I will get very nervous now. Well, as a, as a <coughs> video camera, well, like being in the Falkland Islands, I suppose, two weeks ago. Um, it's been recorded also on tape, and if anyone actually wants to get a tape afterwards, they could actually ask uh, Edward for a tape, and we will try and make some copies of it, which are something like the original. Well, I'd like to now hand over to Roddy Enthoven, who... I hope you don't mind saying, was president when I first limped into this place in 1948. And um, as an active participant in the revolution, uh, he's very kindly agreed to introduce the speakers. I think actually it's a thing which really needs a, a good clap, because it must be a very brave thing to do. Anyway, to <laughs> Now, oh, I wonder, is this the right way to talk or should I hold this further away? <laughs> just, just relax. Just, just about right? Yes. That's fine. Because this is, well, for me, a very nostalgic evening because when I was here, I won't tell you how long ago, we had regular meetings of students and members to meet distinguished people, Edwin Lutyen, G.K. Chesterton, who, who knows. And um, we learnt a great deal, and I'm very impressed that you should, President, have revived this. The only difference is we have more gadgets and um, rather more distinguished people and fewer students, as that may be, as it is. Now, as usual, the President has said more or less what I was <laughs> proposing to say. <laughs> you do not need two introductions, but uh, as you know, the subject is the revolution of the so-called of the 30s, uh, resulting from the change in social world and building techniques. I don't know whether revolution is the quite the correct word, except the revolution came later when the students criticized the way they were being taught. The change itself was uh, slow, a slow birth, uh, rather earlier than many people realize, and uh, might be more of the sort of David Attenborough fascinating insect emerging from a chrysalis. Um, so that I, I'd like to put the dates right. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, why the changes came about and 
well the impact on on the world, on the country generally, and where it's going later. Um, the public, of course, did not appreciate the, the changes from you know, it modernism, the international international style, the. Uh, contemporary style. I'm glad it's come back to just being plain modern because it is more straightforward. But uh, I think they have come around quite a lot. Initially, people like penguins don't necessarily like a new environment they haven't met before. Now, seems right after looking back after 25, 30 years to assess uh, the differences in interpretation, the, the really significant uh, originators from the imitators, from those who are little more than skin grafters. Uh, if I could talk a little about the background of the, that led up to the changes in the uh, 20s, if I can do so briefly. Robert Atkinson, of course, uh, was a, a lively eclectic, really. He used classical detail, but he didn't impose a classical uh, education, really, on us. And nor did Howard Robertson, who came after him. There must have been a link between the two because in 1925, where the milestone of the Paris exhibition, Art Decoratif, when there was a period, an exhibition which was divided rather clearly between modern and what we call modern, um, the competition for our national pavilion was assessed by Goodhart Rendell. It was a limited competition, and he was quite sure that he had awarded it to Robert Atkinson, and was rather shattered to find he'd awarded it to Howard Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, apart from that, at that time, as I say, modern work was rearing its head because Gullo Corbusier, after all, was writing then, in 1925. He wasn't this old chap of the 30s, he, he was already churning out books and using words which writers found very difficult to interpret accurately. Words like machin, brute, and so on, they, they, they misused. Uh, well, the whole background from then onwards was very confusing for the students. Uh, first, of course, the influence of the Bauhaus, Gropius, please, less is more, aseptic, white, horizontal, box-like, humanized by silver birch trees. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, uh, concrete, new material was used differently by architects like uh, Mendelssohn, the expressionist aspect. Einstein Tower, which had very little relation to the structure of the modernists. But uh, that word expressionism, I suppose one could have applied later to Corbusier's Chapel of Ronchon, which one of our distinguished critics impertinently described as Mickey Mouse architecture. Then Lloyd Wright was a and on his own, he uh, had a great influence because he showed how lumps of solid cantilevered slabs could eliminate the solid walls that had been thought essential. All very puzzling for the student, and they felt, of course, that they were not being taught enough on the structural side. Um, 
they protested they wanted to have a bigger say in what was done and uh, Goodhart Rendell who still maintained he was by then the, one of the directors maintained that the sort of Beaux-Arts background had its place he had to give way well now tonight we've got a task force uh, and if anyone thinks it's going to be like and full of architectural La Ronde, they're going to be disappointed. <laughs> it would be a nice thought, of course, if, if Sir John Summerson uh, could have ended up embracing uh, Jim Richards. <laughs> like I sort of, they do in football matches. <laughs> That is, I think, I've wasted your time. And now, Peter Tangles came and to start unraveling the whole thing, I will call on Sir John Summerson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, Roddy and Evan mentioned the word nostalgia. Believe me, I feel absolutely no nostalgia for the, 18, uh, the nine, was it the 1830s or the 1930s? 1930s. Uh, 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 the 1830s were good and more exciting. Um, the 1930s I found extraordinarily boring, I must say. I, I look back on them without any nostalgia at all. A terrible decade. Um, uh, one great difference between now and then is this that today there's immense interest in what happened in the 1930s. I get people coming to the same museum for the sole purpose of asking me what I remember about the 1930s. I send them away with what I think is usually described as a flea in the ear. Um, now, the great difference between then and now is really a most interesting one. There is this a very keen interest in the 1930s on the part of young people of the 1980s. Now, in the 1930s, there was no interest at all among young people in the architecture of the 1870s and 80s. Now, if there had been, I don't believe that the modern movement would have happened. The modern movement arose from a feeling that everything before 1914 was a load of old rubbish. We felt there was a great hard crust of, of meaningless architecture which had to be broken through and that was what many of us felt in the 1920s and 30s. I went to the Bartlett School in 1922, and we were already <laughs> uh, we were already greedy for the modern. We all wanted to be modern. That was the word, and and we were modern. The students, their drawing boards would say, "I want to get a modern feeling into it," you know. And what that meant usually was having a very hard line round the thing, you know, like that. Um, and uh, it had to be, it had to be massive, heavy. And I suppose our ideal modern building at that time was Adelaide House, uh, which is, of course, a sort of... What? Uh, <laughs> Now, look, Adelaide House was absolutely the thing in, in 1920s, and Max knows perfectly well it was, too. Yeah. Of course, it was related to Burnett's uh, back elevation of the British Museum. That, that had the modern feeling in it. And we tried to get that into our designs. And uh, that was long before any of us have heard of uh, Le Corbusier or Dreyfus. Now, my first sight of in architecture. I was in 1923 
Um, when I looked through the window of a bookshop in the Boulevard Saint Michel and saw this thing lying open, and uh, I didn't know what to make of it, it seemed to be rather a cranky affair, uh, but it did register. I remember this thing, Vesian Architecture. Then I heard of it when I got back to England, and people talked about it, and I eventually bought a copy from the foreign newspaper shop in Charlotte Street. Um, and of course it was enormously infectious, that book. And we got Le Corbusier all wrong at first. We thought the book was the thing, this wonderful puritanical uh, approach to architecture. Everything had to be useful and hard and so on. And we uh, thought the designs were merely an inter uh, translation of the ideas in the book into a rather crude reality. It wasn't for quite a time that most of us realized that Le Corbusier had a close relationship to the modern movement in painting and sculpture. Um, I remember the first article I wrote about uh, Le Corbusier's idea of modernity. It was in the, uh, in the Scotsman of all papers. I was teaching in Edinburgh at the time, and I tried my hand at an article on what I called modernism in architecture. And to everybody's, well, anyway, to my surprise, it was put on the leader page of the Scotsman. And there was a most appalling row. Uh, the correspondence went on in, the, in the, 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 the correspondence column of the, uh, of the Scotsman for about a fortnight. And uh, I remember one of the letters said, if this is the kind of thing that is being taught to students in the College of Art, something ought to be done about it. And my chief at the College of Art, said, look, Thomason, my dear chap, if you must write this kind of thing, please don't sign it. Uh, well, um, then um, later on, I, I was on the staff of the Architect and Building News, and I wrote an article pointing out the uh, connection of Le Corbusier with modern painting, with Picasso, Braque, uh, Leger, and so on. And uh, I showed this article to the editor. It had two illustrations to go side by side. One was the plan of the, uh, uh, the uh, Pavillon Suisse, uh, is it what was called the, the Swiss Pavilion in, the, in Paris with Le Corbusier. And opposite was um, a, a Picasso drawing. And uh, that was the whole point of the article. And I showed it to the editor. He read the article. He said, well, that's all right. And he passed the plan of the chicken big not the head motel. And uh, then he looked at the Picasso drawing. And he said, yeah, well, that's all right. But I shouldn't publish that. Well, I quote that because it, it shows the state of uh, thought about these things in the 30s, that even Picasso, who is now, I suppose, one of the most celebrated architects in the whole of art history, was uh, familiar only to a very, very small number of people. That small number of people who usually wore black hats with whitish brims. And to the editor of a professional uh, magazine, the idea of putting a Picasso drawing in was a totally obnoxious. And uh, that, that was the feeling that we had something in architecture, uh, as well as in painting and so on, uh, which was up against such a hard crust of ignorance and prejudice uh, that we were, in fact, in the nature of, uh, of uh, a revolutionist. Um, Well, then one thing led to another. The uh, Mars Group was founded, in which Max Fry took the leading part, of course. And uh, there was the famous Mars Group exhibition of 1938. I was looking at the catalogue of that just before I came here. It filled me with horror. I read most of it. But um, uh, 
Uh, to come back to what really is my main theme, um, it seems to me that if there had been more awareness in the 1930s of what architecture in England had been up to since 1870, uh, there might have been no modern movement at all, um, or the modern movement would have taken a very different course. And I think one of the good things about today is that there is this interest in our predecessors. Uh, it's partly, I suppose, the result of the enormous uh, ascendancy of art history in our time. It was a Marxist, I suppose, would say that uh, revolutions are based on uh, knowledge of the past and the analysis of the past. But I think, to a great extent, they're also based on ignorance of the past and prejudice uh, against the past. And that, I think, accounted for a great deal in what went on in the years which followed the, the 1930s. Um, I think that really is a sum total of what I want to say. Uh, of course, anybody of my age does rather wonder what is going on at the present time and how it is related to what's been going on in the past. Um, my friend Charles Jenks sends me all sorts of beautiful books, a really the most horrible design I've ever seen, uh, designs by people like Michael Graves, Charles Moore Venturi, uh, and a dreadful man called Boffield. Everybody likes Boffield here, do they? <laughs> well, I mean, I, honestly, I've never seen such awful, regressive, and ghastly stuff in my life. Um, it shows, of course, that I'm getting old and can't face the new thing. But um, on the other hand, it seems to me there's a lot of extremely good designing being done now. I immensely admire them. Uh, uh, um, what's his name? James, uh, uh, Jim, we all call him, you know. Sterling. No, uh, Sterling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a man who looked at, he has his roots, he's a functionalist, he has his roots in the modern movement. And he comes out of the modern movement and uh, does all sorts of uh, fantastic, magnificent things. Uh, but his roots are in the territory which we all knew with the 1930s. I went to see his uh, Oxford building the other day and I wondered what would have happened if that had been presented the Mars Group Exhibition of 1938. Well, I think we should have loved it. I think it would have been just the thing for us. And yet it uh, seems to fit the present time um, extremely well. Um, so that, that is my contribution for this evening. The point I really want to make is the, what an excellent thing it is that young people of today are looking back to the 30s, are trying to analyze historically, not nostalgically, but historically, um, their predecessors and what has happened, what has led up to the present day, and out of that, uh, well, we shall see what, what they will make of it. May I just do what I intended to do before and run through the names on the task force just to let you know what order they will be speaking in. Uh, John Summerson was put down as talking about Etchell who translated Corbusier. He hasn't done so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no matter. Uh, Etchell's, of course, designed uh, the Crawford building with horizontal windows, which earned him the reputation of designing for flatfish at the time. And he retaliated by saying he, he was saved by, he was designing f le with leg screens. Uh, now, after the next speaker, Jack Pritchard, speaking on the 
on the modern movement as seen by the client. He is a rare example of uh, owner and uh, client and uh, generally appreciated the modern movement. Also his, his wife, I'm delighted to see her today because she's the sister of uh, one of our leading students when I was here a long time ago, uh, Jill Cook. She and Lady Collings, Ruth Collings, um, were neck and neck to be the, the first lady qualified lady architect. And I think uh, Jill Cook won on a photo finish and she at least did design some buildings. After him, Max Fry uh, has the marvelous experience of having worked for both Crocus and Corbusier. I don't think anyone can equal that. Uh, Cyril Mardell, of course, uh, was a partner of FRS York, who did much publici produced publicity for the modern changes, uh, and also a very good designer and is now the firm of YRM, which is York, Rosenberg and Mardell. Peter Morrow, his special experience was in coming to this country from abroad and assessing what was happening and how it related to what he knew about his work, of course, is very impressive. Uh, Anthony Cox promised to come uh, he couldn't come to the dinner. I don't know, is, is he, he is here? Where is he? Where is he? Oh, God. I, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, so he uh, was a very uh, lively student, I may say, with his wife, Susan Bevan Smith, and um, will tell us about that, which was really a, a revolution. and both in tuition and bringing students into the picture. Overup, in, in the consulting engineer and, uh, uh, is unique, I think, in having built an organization of structure and architecture aesthetics with his partner, Philip Dowson. There are other engineers such as, say, Nervi or Buckminster Fuller, who would only design big structures covering large spaces, who were absolutely foxed if they were asked to design anything more intricate, and he has achieved the solution. Felix Topolsky, the artist, painter, who we're delighted to see here, and, and I hope will stress the importance of bringing painters, sculptors, into the picture and uh, working with, with architects. And lastly, James Richards, Jim Richards as we know him, is going to sum up, and no one is in a better position having edited the, uh, the architectural review for many years, written many books, critic. He was, uh, I'm proud to say, he was a student when I was on the staff. Very <laughs> A year which produced a lot of very brilliant uh, people, and, and uh, most of them didn't, didn't actually build buildings. No matter, that is the order. Because of my memory being so lousy nowadays, I have had to, and I can't remember what I'm talking about sometimes, <laughs> I have had to write it down and I'll have mainly to read it. I've been a customer, in one way or another, to six architects. 
starting with uh, Corb's partner, Charlotte Perrion, uh, she designed an exhibition stand for Vanessa. And Breuer designed the Isacon lawn chair, Wells coats, lawn road flats, Walter Gropius and Max Fry, who, with Morton Shand, helped to get them out of the bloody Nazis. And uh, my daughter Jennifer and her husband designed for us a remarkably efficient and lovely house. I'll concentrate only on Wells and Gropius and Fry and a mention of Breuer at the end. Molly and I had a very great admiration for Wells. He was all-knowing, all-knowing, and not easy to work with. When the three of us were planning our house in, our house in Lawn Road one day, Molly murmured, shouldn't we really build, have a, a, a multiple house rather than just one for one family? Wells, of course, was enthusiastic, and so the lawn rows flats were conceived. Molly's brief described the kind of people such a building could be for, their income level, their mechanical and their service needs, and Wells Coates provided those needs with a wonderful, elegant completeness, quite remarkable. But when costs were high, higher than his own estimates, to find economies, it was impossible to have a relaxed discussion with him and his experts. His knowledge was, of course, up to date and beyond. He could not be questioned. He could not be questioned. He must always be right. But I had, I had no building experience and no financial experience. Whereas Randall Bell, who was his customer for Palace Gate, knew better. Now Neve Brown. When planning the recent Hayward 36, he completely failed to understand. He made a replica of the, of the, of the minimum flat, and he used it as a true way completely ruining the whole idea of his completeness. His next example was not a patch on what we did at Dorland Hall in 1933. Gropius and Fry, with Fry and Morton Shand, we got him out of the Nazis. They were very, very different from Wells. They had all the technical knowledge and much more. Gropius had a profound, uh, reach, far-reaching and wide imagination, always looking in front of himself. Some of you may know that he was being greatly impressed with the um, first landing on the moon. And when he was dying, he was delirious, and he was heard to say, he had had a project to build a settlement on the moon. He died looking in front of himself. Rather like Epicurus who wrote, the art of living well and the art of dying well are very much like Gropius. Breuer also poet, and pardon me if I just quote from him, architecture is surely beyond pure form, beyond pure use, beyond just a roof over our head, beyond just human sentiment, beyond just that, just the product of the market. And again he wrote, as he said his own poem, it was a poem, sounds to see with eyes, the void with you touch with your elbows, the fragrance of dimensions the juice of stone. He was a remarkable man, hard to come to an agreement with, but once there, he was very easy to work with. And the team, Gropius, Breuer, and the splendid craftsman we had, uh, Harry Mansell, 
was a wonderful thing to watch. Thank you. Dear fellow bourgeois, <laughs> the, the quite certain consequences of any revolution is the creation of a new bourgeoisie. I salute you. <laughs> if there is any doubt that the modern movement was a sort of revolution, I could quote my little enemy comrade Ben who defines one as being a stage at which nothing will be the same again and he's quite right what happened at that time changed the whole furniture of our life and was a very great benefit to the office of works but I came down to London in the late twenties, middle twenties, a young man in search of fortune and trying to find out what it was all about. And I spent a long time messing about in artist studios. I had my years in the wilderness, wondering how on earth to fit the pieces together. How to make an architecture. I mean, there was the RIBA in Conduit Street in an elegant little building there. And it was a kind of gentleman's club. But don't laugh, they were very serious about architecture. But it was an attenuating architecture of that period, getting very, very thin in the column. And uh, they didn't know quite, they were very polite to me. Um, but there was no answer there. Now I've been asked to speak not only about my conversion and revelation, but about my contacts with Walter Gropius. And really he comes in, I could describe to you a perfect circle. Because when I look round at the London of my period, and at that time they were destroying Regent Street, and I teamed up with a young man named Christian Barman and we had a little journal. I did the drawings, he did the script. Uh, and this part of the West End was crumbling in, in clouds of dust and speculation. It was a terrible sight. And uh, I'm a classicist at heart, you see. Something a scholar even. Uh, uh, and, but still I was very puzzled. And Christian led me to a thing called the Design and Industry Association, which was presided over by the patron of our age, Frank Pick. And I'd seen these tube stations, which was a ray of hope for me. And with Christian, I joined this Design and Industry Association, which had as its motto, fitness for purpose. And that was good enough for me. And there I found not only extremely nice companions, but I found what was going on elsewhere, which answered nearly all my doubts, which I'd been entertaining for years, very seriously. I saw what was going on there, I understood it at once, absolutely at once, and set about designing my first modern building. And I would like to tell you this, that we use concrete as a revolutionary material, but not too seriously. But, uh, and the buildings required a lot of maintenance afterwards. But this always happens. In a revolution, you see, you make this big effort, and you knock your elders on the head, and, and it's marvelous. And but the nice thing about designing these early buildings in concrete, that we had no modules, 
we had none of the things that came later, these horrible things that were thought up, modulors, and these nasty things that came from the ministry, you know, set designs and things like that, and all these second-rate chaps getting into power. Uh, and it was a most marvellous freedom to design as you wish to design, uh, in proportion. And my chief love was not Groupies, it was Mies. Mies taught me the virtue of materials, the virtue of steel, the virtue of concrete, how to find a new proportion to set beside that of the classical proportion, which I loved, uh, but which fitted the new materials. Don't bother about people. Uh, they were the same people we had to design for, whether they lived in working class flats or rich ones. Uh, but the problem, the architectural problem, was what was to be the new set of proportions. That was the thing, and that was the delight for somebody like myself working in that period. When Gropius came, I was already deep in it. I, 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 I loved the man anyway. Jack brought him over. I wrote a letter that got him through the Gestapo, and we worked for a very short period very happily together, the worshipful great lion and the little English chap uh, working together. It, it worked a treat, and he was sad to go, I was sad to miss him, but that was that. By that time, the war has come, and our story was just about ended, and my speech is ended too. identify myself as the M in YRM and uh, but of course incidentally I retired some years ago and I work for my wife <laughs> tax wise is much better and uh, we do some housing in the West Indies and, and in Ireland and so on but going back to the early or to the late 30s I should say and the, the immediate post war uh, period in the late 30s I worked for Max which uh, taught me an awful lot. In joining York uh, in, in 1944, I think it was, just before the end of the war in Europe, we uh, started our practice on, on a, in a very limited, modest beginning. In fact, we had an office uh, at the back of Pontesuaire's office. And, uh, we could find a room to sit down, provided everybody, the partners and our two assistants, didn't turn up at once. So we had to arrange our, our sort of uh, sessions in the office to coincide with, with the uh, availability of seats. Uh, but we believe firmly in what we were doing. We were very, very sort of uh, keen, and we, we, we had no hesitation that what we were doing was right. And uh, this sort of our aims and our enthusiasms, uh, enthusiasms was also shared with, with many of our colleagues abroad. Uh, there was much more contact, I think, between uh, architects and different countries. But of course, we were a much smaller band of rebels in the And the inspirations derived from Bauhaus, the Mars Group, and, and the Union of Architects was terribly important to us, and, and we we strive for uh, a bit of new architecture. Uh, when our practice grew, uh, we were able quite often to persuade our clients to to engage or to. Uh, well, to get our clients to commission sculptors like Henry Moore, uh, Elizabeth Frink, uh, MacWilliam, and Garbo, and uh, we had murals by uh, Kenneth Rowntree and William Scott and so on. And uh, this, of course, all helped uh, our sort of kind of 
environment to, to we had an environment which was uh, not confined to our architecture only, but which, which was more complete. Uh, and and it, uh, it somehow rather built up to a, to a great movement or great incentive for us to, to do our best for the new architecture. The, the great men of that period, apart from Max, of course, um, were uh, apart from Max, were people like, um, well, Frank Lloyd Wright and called them after to name but a few. And uh, it's very sad when, when you hear these people these great men being debunked by a young generation of, of architects now. And I, I remember on one occasion at an RIB, no, not an RIB, it was an architecture club dinner, uh, when one of the young speakers got up and, and referred to Corb's work as a pain in the ass. Well, I think that is heresy. I mean, that's terrible. Um, Well, the, I believe a great number of the younger generation are following their own trail. Um, buildings like the Killingdon Council offices, where the roof line is more important than the plan, is crazy. I mean, so much on the wrong lines that it, it, it really makes them Sad. And also the kind of romantic nonsense we have seen in urban street architecture is particularly inappropriate. Well, even the work of the great individuals, uh, the romantics of the past, rediscovered now and again, such as Gargui and Macintosh and all that, they cannot be relied on us as. Uh, as uh, guide, guides for our inspiration. And all this really makes me rather glad that I'm not in the front line of, of architects any longer. But perhaps that's a sign of old age. I speak as a backroom boy rather than a pioneer, although I'm very old. I was uh, not in the forefront then when I arrived in this country. Um, it says on here, um, designed with beauty and built in truth, uh, which is a very nice and straightforward and simple quotation, and it does underline the dichotomy in architecture, which has two sides to it, whether you call it form and content, or uh, art and science, or whatever. There are two sides to architecture, and I think if one looks at the period of the last 50 years, um, it is one of changing emphasis on one side or the other, form or content. Um, the modern movement, um, as I experienced it when I came from Switzerland, where it was well established, um, in this country it was in its um, infancy, and most um, architects here still try to beautify their building by giving them a kind of neo-Georgian um, facade, uh, like a um, most of the telephone exchanges and blocks of flats and so on. Um, so this country in this respect was rather backward. Functionalism um, in a rather narrow form was well established um, abroad uh, in Switzerland and in Germany um, and the concession to 
beauty there, of course, uh, was rather superficial. It consisted of a compulsory mural of Wilhelm Tell stuck on the gable wall. Um, it was not properly integrated at all. Um, the idea in the beginning was rather simplistic. The idea was that if uh, everything worked well and if the physical function was satisfied, everything else would be okay automatically. Um, the slogans, form follows function, or uh, truth is beauty, um, I think were characteristic of this very oversimplified kind of uh, recipe of that period. Um, there were very few architects here, and I can only think of uh, Tecton, um, with whom I was lucky enough to work for two years, who realized that this kind of oversimplified idea of functionalism, which concerned itself with the physical function only, was totally um, inadequate. And they addressed themselves to uh, other things. Um, light and heat and warmth and hygiene simply wasn't enough. Um, they were considered reactionary by the more purest kind of architects of the time. And I remember working on High Point Two, which was considered as a, a retrograde step from High Point One, whose um, bland simplicity um, was preferred to the preoccupation with uh, proportion and scale and, and uh, refinements. Um, the, this very narrow interpretation of what architecture was supposed to be about resulted in a great number of um, characterless building and general monotony. And of course, it also attracted a lot of people to the study of architecture who had really no business to be architects because they had no creative ability. But since it all appeared to be so easy and so automatic, um, I think a lot of people came into the profession who had no talent. And I don't mean they couldn't draw. A lot of people can draw extremely well and tell the architects. Um, most architects today, I think, recognize that buildings must respond to place, must be particularized, must have a face, and that the kind of faceless and rather schematic treatment, schematic treatment of buildings results in a dull and unsympathetic environment. Unfortunately today, all sorts of bogus remedies are being put forward to put matters right. And one can already see a whole range of cliches appearing, which will be self-defeating, because uh, these buildings will look alike again, and that we will have a kind of monotony, albeit of a different kind. Today, an architect have unlimited possibilities. And it is really um, astonishing that people find it necessary to dream up um, self-consciously some kind of style. I uh, can't call it style because a style is something you can only assess in retrospect with uh, fads and, and fashions of um, you know, giving their building a kind of superficial treatment in a desperate attempt to make them more inter interesting. And I think it is a great pity that uh, the media and the architectural journalists which we have today seem to be totally incapable of recognizing uh, when the emperor has no clothes on and the place is, is swarming with naked emperors. Uh, just to finish uh, off uh, uh, my um, very short history of the last 50 years, I went to uh, um, um, School of Architecture as an external examiner and a, a girl, came, a student came in with her work. Perhaps I should say that she had grass green hair, which is not irrelevant. Um, and she pinned up her drawings and um, it was a jolly nice scheme. But the entrance, on the entrance she stuck 
a kind of bastardized portico. And I said, you know, this is a lovely scheme, but why on earth did you want to do that? And she said, well, it's postmodernism, sir. And I said, yes, I know, I can see that. But uh, she said, don't you like it? And I said, no, I don't. And she said, why not? I said, well, to me, this is a symptom of decadence. And she said, what's wrong with decadence? <laughs> After the pioneers, I'll try to recall, as truthfully as I can, the local scene here in Bedford Square in the five years from 1933, when I began as a student, to 1938, the year of Munich, when I finished the course. Like many students in my year, when I first arrived at the AA, I had no idea of what had been happening in Europe in architecture. Indeed, I, I was vague about architecture altogether, anywhere. As for the school, uh, most of Tecton had passed through and had left no trace. Uh, we began with uh, Trajan column lettering and graded watercolour washes and started the slow plod through history from Egypt onwards. It must have been about halfway through the first year that something different hit us. I remember the Gropius exhibition at the RIBA, still in Conduit Street, and I find that I bought the Etchell's translation towards a new architecture at that time. And at the start of the second year, I got the complete call, 1929 to 34, heady stuff. The revelation for me was consummated when my second year ended with a pilgrimage to Paris and nearer home with the completion of Tecton's High Point One. By the time we reached our third year, most of us regarded modern architecture as the natural approach to design. But it wasn't a simply a style that motivated us, but a method. Other influences were at work, too. Central Europe threatened. Student refugees from Hitler were joining the AA course attitudes were becoming strongly polarized between left and right, or as we saw it, between good and evil. This reached a climax in that third year when the Spanish Civil War began. For us at that time, I think, modern architecture seemed to become transmuted into a crusade for a fresh physical form for a good life in the just society. It became a symbol for a desirable future. And it's not surprising that many students, and to begin with, I think my year in particular, thought the AA course inadequate. We attacked the socially irrelevant programs, the lack of building science, the absence of critical discussion, the denial of group working, and we were vocal in demanding changes. Then, during our third year, Rouse was made principal. His horizons were refreshingly wide. He introduced what was called the unit system, and I think I must say something about that. Instead of five separate cohorts of 50 students entering annually, each tending to be isolated from the others and each based in its own studio, there were 15 units of about 17 entering each term. 
Now, each studio held three units, but not consecutive ones. You might get unit two from the bottom of the school, and unit eight from the middle, and unit 15 from the top, all working on different things in the same studio and interacting in a way that had never happened before. I think this interaction goes some way to explain the unusual student solidarity that came about later. By the time we were in our fourth year, and the council made the extraordinary appointment of Goodhart Rendell as director, presumably to stem the tide, the poor man was pitched into a head-on collision. His beliefs were diametrically opposite to the climate the students had generated. He was a Beaux-Arts man. He said, and I quote, the principles underlying all sound architectural training are those generally recognized in France. But the France he looked to was not the one that excited us. Of course, he didn't stem the tide, but that's another story. The tide rolled on. Indeed, uh, John Summerson, reviewing the school exhibition in the summer of 1938, concluded, uh, without uh, it seems actually committing himself, that from top to bottom of the school, everybody seems to agree upon what kind of architecture is worth making. Consistency of this kind could not possibly be imposed. It must come from the students themselves. And he continued, I have seen a fair number of school exhibitions at the AA and elsewhere, but never one with this singular unanimity stamped all over it. It is very extraordinary indeed. Well, so much for the impact of the modern movement on the AA when I was a student here. But I've been asked to end, I don't know why, with a mention of the post-war factory at Bryn Mawr in South Wales. Perhaps it makes an appropriate coda because my dictionary defines coda as an independent and often elaborate passage introduced after the natural conclusion of a movement. <laughs> so, shortly after we finished at the AA, 11 of us, all contemporaries, optimistically started ACP. We were dispersed by the war, but some of us got together again when it ended. And we were fortunate to cut our teeth on what I suppose was the first post-war modern building of any size on this island. One of my partners described it as an alternative to a postgraduate thesis, six years delayed. The engineer to whom it owed so much was Arab. And as he's going to speak ne next, I think that's the place for me to stop. This morning... <coughs> oh, wait one minute. This morning I received a letter uh, where I was told that at this dinner I was going to speak about um, engineering's contribution to the movement. I hadn't heard about that before and I hadn't promised to speak. In fact, they said I, wouldn't, I would not speak. But uh, this, of course, has happened before, so I, I'm not surprised. But anyhow, it doesn't matter because can you think of anything more boring than that? <laughs> no, engineering. And uh, fortunately for you, I can let you off very lightly. Because uh, as far as I can make out, 
engineering did not contribute to the movement at all. <laughs> it, it wasn't a movement by engineers, manufacturers, or, or builders who wanted to make more rational building. It was a movement by architects, writers, artists, uh, yes, well, hang on, journalists, what you like. And, uh, but unfortunately, these people had a great admiration for the engineering structures which had been built by a previous generation of engineers. And therefore, they insisted on building engine housing and things like engineering structures and um, which they knew, knew nothing about. Now, that of course made it necessary for them to, to get some help from engineers, from manufacturers and so on. And they were then going to apply their engineering skills to the building of houses and buildings and things like that, which they didn't know anything about because they had never used it for that purpose. And uh, lots of questions arose should a concrete wall have damp cores or not, or that kind of thing. Well, the architects didn't know because they had never built in concrete. The engineers didn't know because they had never built buildings. But actually, with the concrete they produced in those days, it jolly well needed a band. <laughs> so that um, there was a problem, and the, the result of that can be seen in many of the structures which were built in those days. They were not good buildings to live in. But, um, well, that being so, there's not <laughs> really I need to, to, to say about it. Um, because, well, I better stop before, because I, otherwise I go on uh, rambling about various things which are not concerned as well as he can, uh, figure, no, he can, he can Tell us. So that I won't bore you anymore, and, and anyhow, it's late now, and uh, we have got a couple of other speakers, and I want to get home, so I will. suggested that I should uh, talk about artists versus architecture. It's such a bore now, so much being said about it, and um, inconclusively that I rather skip it, because um, uh, I don't feel that anything has happened yet in the right direction, which to me is not fitting in mural paintings in empty spaces, but um, collaboration collaboration from the very outset between um, the artist and architect. In other words, an artist should be in the architect's office when the first projects, plans are being created. That's probably the only way. The other way is to create, for an artist, create architecture of his own, which I happen to be doing now, but <laughs> that's another story. The thing which I feel I should, could say, Ah, not to bore you too much, is to offer a little anecdote on the theme of my work with Lubetkin. And here comes, uh, I think, an important point that um, I really have nothing to do with the 30s. I've been, um, I've been sort of on the edges of it as a youngster, and um, uh, I feel that um, the war came, in spite of what Marx said, uh, war interrupted the movement uh, and in consequence it continued. It continued after the war and in England the festival of Britain was uh, to some extent uh, an energetic continuation. Unfortunately, for political reasons, um, interrupted horribly. But uh, architecture was going on and here I come to this, that um, Lubetkin, who was not mentioned today, though Tecton was mentioned, um, who had masses of bad luck 
uh, with his work, as we know, and with projects. But uh, at some point, he oh, he built a complex of working class uh, uh, estate and um, and asked me to do murals for it. And I'll be very quick about it. It's a it's a short and sad uh, little tale. Uh, the concept was that I do four murals for four entrances. And um, in other words, it belonged to that boring concept of fitting in a painting into a ready little space. But still, it was a challenge and I did it uh, gladly, but uh, policies of local councillors and Lubetkin's wisdom demanded that I shouldn't be paid because if I was paid any honest price, the local borough would protest, councillors would claim that uh, public money is wasted. So in consequence, I was paid what whitewashing of those spaces would cost. <laughs> and, um, and then indeed, the questions came at the council. Uh, we are wasting public money, what about it? And they were shut up when they were told that um, uh, the cost was no more than plainly painting over the spaces. Well, that was the beginning. I painted those murals uh, in spite of the protestations. Uh, and surprisingly, they, they, they took on. Even, I think, architectural review under our friend's command uh, produced a sort of impressive article on this and um, and a frontispiece uh, reproducing one of my paintings. Uh, altogether, um, uh, it was very much accepted and noticed. In consequence, the councillors started to take pride in it. And um, when the local boys uh, played the games, ball games, against those murals and smudging, smudging them with mud and whatnot, uh, they started to worry because they were people coming to see the result. And I didn't worry because I thought it was rather nice to have some additional texture <laughs> over them, but, but um, uh, they were anxious. And um, at some point, after a year or two, uh, they approached me that I should um, uh, retouch the murals um, because of the embarrassment of it. Uh, and at that point, I felt I am allowed to blackmail the councillors by stating that gladly I'll do it, but if I'm paid the wages of an ordinary laborer per hour on that job, to which I hadn't had a reply. They simply refused to accept my proposition. A year or two later, I've been passing by and I thought, oh well, I look at the jolly murals, uh, in what state they are. There were no murals. The walls were whitewashed. <laughs> Thank you. Well, time is getting on, so I shall be short. Uh, I see on this piece of paper I'm supposed to speak on the cause of the movement and its effect today. Well, the cause of the movement is sitting around this table, and the effect today is lying all over the London. So I think that doesn't need any embroidery. Um, I'm also supposed to sum up, which of course is quite impossible, so I shan't attempt to do that. I shall take advantage of being the next speaker, the last speaker, and say one or two things that I regard as corrections or modifications of what has been said already. Uh, the chief thing I've missed in the uh, comments on the modern movement that have been made this evening have been that uh, uh, all the emphasis has been on the visual side on form, on architectural effect, and so on. And uh, I think um, the, in fact, the concentration has been on style, in spite of the fact that architects 
in the 1930s rather claimed that they weren't concerned with style. Um, of course, they designed in a, um, the style that their, the fathers of the modern movement were then putting about. But for them, that was a, a flag they waved rather than a cause they believed in. And what we forget now is that the beginning um, of the modern movement was the professional, profession's neglect of planning and the whole sort of social involvement of the profession in um, the questions of the day. Um, it's easy to forget that in the 1930s there was practically no planning legislation. There had been one Ribbon Development Act in the 1925, but otherwise there was very little planning legislation and the whole of um, the architectural profession was blind to the demands of low-cost housing, of planning, and all the things that made architects um, really, um, that should have given architects a sense of responsibility. Um, it all seems very simplistic now, but um, it is worth remembering that that was how um, the, uh, the real cause is that the modern movement fought for, and they produced things like the Athens Charter, which um, Siam and the Mars group, where it was their gospel, they seemed um, pretty simplistic now, but it was the outstanding document, and um, the modern movement wasn't. It was only incidentally concerned with creating a, uh, a series of visual images. That is one um, correction I wanted to make. The other one is um, one concerned with the climate of opinion when the... Um, in the 1930s, the time we're concerned with. I date from before that, I may say. I was in the AA in 19, from 1924 to 29, when the modern movement really wasn't, um, um, certainly had, had no influence in the curriculum. I mean, I spent a lot of my time casting shadows and um, designing. I think my fifth year design subject was an Italian embassy on the edge of a precipice. Which was, um, it was fine, but it wasn't really what the um, movement was about. I left the A in 1929, and my, what Anthony Cox called my coda, was to go into the office of Sir Anne Williams, who, with whom I worked um, on the Dorchester Hotel until that um, came to an end and I went to America. Well, now, the thing I wanted to say about the, um, the, those times is that it's easy to forget now how um, very strong was the Neo-Georgian movement. I mean, we, um, uh, that was really the thing the modern movement was reacting about, the strength of Neo-Georgianism. If the enemy of good architecture today is the illiterate buildings that exploit the fact that there are no longer any stylistic rules to stop an educated architect um, from appearing what they are, um, the enemy then was the uneducated architect who thought they could rely on neo-Georgian styling but didn't realize that the style was basically, um, that a, a style that was basically domestic can't successfully be applied to multi-story office buildings and so on. It was um, uh, what we in the 1930s was doing was trying to throw overboard all the sort of rules um, that the neo-Georgians were trying uh, to apply, as I say, very, uns very unsuccessfully. And the fact that um, uh, there are no rules since is what has made um, uh, modern architecture very difficult to, um, the contemporary architecture extremely difficult to understand and to um, um, codify in any way. Uh, the, um, of course, we are the enemy now because um, everybody sees all around us not the modern architecture that we tried to produce for the effect of not having any rules. But although we're the enemy, 
as Do um, Sir John Summerson said, it's surprising how the younger generation still hankers after the period that we represent. Like him, I'm always being visited by young architects writing theses and doing doctorates and um, learning what really went on in the 30s. Um, it's our turn to be reviled, but um, we shall come back and I suppose this evening is some indication that the interest continues.